Well, beloved in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father and our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Within our three-year lectionary, the assigned gospel lesson that the Holy Spirit moved St. Mark to record for our instruction and our building up in righteousness is often broken into two separate lessons. Because of the sheer relevance of this text, I am going to preach it in its entirety and will do my best within a reasonable time frame, so bear with me, to show just how well these two lessons are connected. And that gets us into today's scripture, beginning with the first part. Today's reading was taken from our gospel lesson read earlier, Mark 10, verse 2 through verse 12, where the reading again follows in the name of the Lord. Please rise for the reading if you're able. And Pharisees came up and in order to test him asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and to send her away. And Jesus said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, he wrote you this commandment. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together... Let not man separate. And in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. And he said to them, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. These are your holy words, Heavenly Father. Sanctify us now in its truth. Your words are truth. Thank you. Please be seated. Our text begins with Pharisees coming to Jesus, hoping once again to trap him or discredit him. This time by challenging him with a question about divorce. Now, right off the bat, this tells us a couple things. Firstly, not only did people who were against Jesus in his own day argue with him trying to discredit his teachings, but things haven't changed that much in our own day. And I can tell you firsthand how many times people, some who say they are Christians, some even under my own spiritual care, get so offended when I attempt to instruct them in the actual teachings of the Bible. All done, of course, in Christian love, in an effort to get them back on track to the true teachings of Christ. But they will argue and debate and try their best to discredit what the Bible actually says and most often doing so in a way that often attempts to discredit me. Oh, you take that Bible too literally, John. Or, you're too negative. Stop judging me. You're so rigid. Or, things are different now. That is not what it means today. Or my favorite one, well... That's what you say. Now, of course, a simple opening up of the Bible and letting Scripture interpret Scripture would negate all of these accusations. But I digress. But that's what these religious Pharisees were doing with Jesus. They came to him in order to discredit him and his teachings. And their object was not to learn the truth and in this case obtain an answer to their question, but rather to get Jesus to make a statement that would dishonor him and his teachings and here regarding divorce, the Pharisees were sure that they had a question that could cause Jesus to compromise himself in some way. And that gets me to my second point. And that is that the Pharisees asking Jesus about divorce tells us that divorce has been an ongoing problem in all ages and all cultures up to our present day. The sad truth is some of us have experienced the pain of divorce personally and no one is immune to the effects divorce has on society. And that's why this text is such an important one. 
because we need to hear and know what God's definition of marriage is and that it is something he himself instituted from the beginning way back in the Garden of Eden immediately after he created the bride and then as the true father of the bride walked her down the aisle so to speak to give her away to her husband Adam. Now, of course, placing such a high standard on God's gift of marriage is often vilified and despised today by so many people. And why is that? Because it doesn't line up with or agree with the edited version of marriage that's championed in today's unspiritual, irreligious, sinful world. The sad truth is that the state of marriage within our culture has been going from bad to worse over the last several decades and bears little, if any, resemblance to the original intention of the Creator. As example, physical intimacy is no longer a holy gift reserved for marriage. Now many consider it just to be one more leisure time activity to engage in. And marriage is certainly not reserved for just a man and a woman anymore. Same-sex marriage is widely accepted now, sadly even within the church. Heck, nowadays you can pretty much marry your dog, your cat, your whatever, and call it all well and good, and our errant society will accept it. Of course, same-sex marriage is an abominable sin that needs to be repented of. Marriage has also become quite disposable. So prenuptial agreements are set up from the get-go to make the inevitable exit easier. And then, of course, there are those who just start living together in sin without bothering to get married in the first place. Then when they get sick and tired of each other, no need to get a divorce, they just walk away. What a mess. And this situation, of course, doesn't just affect the couple who have decided to live together, but it affects everyone who loves them. And it especially affects the children who oftentimes are raised by step-parents and have to deal with six, eight, nowadays even ten grandparents instead of the normal four. And what is so tragic is that the children lose out on the stability of the lifelong commitment that mom and dad have to each other. And on top of that, many children believe that they might be the cause of the breakup. Or even worse, that once the parents are separated, mom or dad might not love or want them anymore. So yes, What our society has done to the sacred institution of marriage is not only immoral, but in the eyes of God, it is a most shameful, scandalous thing. Nevertheless, as we can see from our text, the issue of divorce is nothing new And the culture at the time of Christ was very much like our own where some were trying to rationalize a permissive attitude toward divorce. Let's read the text again. Mark 10, 2-4 again reads, And Pharisees came up and in order to test him asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Jesus answered them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and to send her away. Now this response from the Pharisees is based upon what Moses said in Deuteronomy 24.1. Let's read that. Deuteronomy 24.1 reads, When a man takes a wife and marries her, if she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some indecency in her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of the house, and she departs out of the house. Now this was not a command by Moses per se. It was a permission granted to a rebellious, hard-hearted people who then made it a command and then added it to their regular rules of practice. 
And the Pharisees interpreted these words so loosely that the husband could divorce his wife for the littlest of reasons, even if she burned his food, put on a little bit of extra weight, or found a better looking woman. Again, I suppose not too much different than our own culture where the sin of no-fault divorce is quite widespread. But the real problem with these Pharisees and their interpretation was that they violated, as I touched on before, one of the basic rules for understanding the scriptures. And that is that scripture interprets scripture. And that's why Jesus corrected their false view regarding Moses and what he said in Deuteronomy with these words. Mark 10, verse 5 through 9 reads, And Jesus said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, he wrote you this commandment. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. Now boy, oh boy, <laughs> is there a lot here that I could preach on concerning our current day. But in the interest of time, I'll just touch on this. God made them male and female. So there's only two sexes, folks, no matter what our sin-sick world wants to promote. And Jesus says a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, which clearly tells us it is God's intention that couples are to be married, not live together. And that marriage is only between a man and a woman, not a man with a man or a woman with a woman. That is nothing more than a sinful perversion of God's plan for marriage. So marriage, according to he who created both the heavens and the earth, is between one man and one woman, period. So Jesus, with his words, is telling these Pharisees, his own disciples, and us, that marriage from the beginning was instituted by God and is bound up with the very creation of man, and his sole intention for marriage is a lifelong union between one man and one woman. So these Pharisees, who permitted a husband to discharge a wife at will for any trumped-up cause, were in serious conflict with the will of God and his intended purpose and goal of marriage for his creation. So after the Pharisees were schooled by Jesus and had left, the disciples still had questions. So Jesus continued his teaching with them. Listen, Mark 10, 10 through 12 reads, And in the house the disciples asked him again about this matter. And he said to them, Whoever divorces his wife. Now, again, using Scripture to interpret Scripture, we see in Matthew 5, 32, except on the ground of sexual immorality. So there is a way out. Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. Now these words further demonstrate for us just how much God is against divorce. But I also want you to notice that Jesus does not teach that divorce is required if husband and wife has sexual contact with another outside of the marriage bed. Because in some cases, through repentance and forgiveness, couples are able to overcome such immorality. But these words from Jesus clearly show that he holds marriage in a very high regard and therefore condemns divorce. 
You see, marriage in the eyes of God is the union of one man and one woman which reflects the mystical union between Christ and his bride, the church. Which means we must look upon the estate of marriage between one man and one woman in the highest regard, knowing it is an essential foundation stone for a healthy society and a healthy church, and that marriage was graciously established by the Creator from the beginning. Okay. So now we move into the second part of today's study, beginning at verse 13. Mark 10, 13 through 16 reads, And they were bringing children to Jesus that he might touch them. And the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, Let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands on them. Now, in a first reading of this, if you just read through it casually, it may seem to be unrelated to the first half of our study. However, when we consider the words that Jesus spoke to the Pharisees, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh, and compare them, letting Scripture interpret Scripture, to the command the Father gave to Adam and Eve in the garden to be fruitful and to multiply and to fill the earth with children. This is another clear indication that marriage is very important to God and that He instituted marriage, not living together, to provide a loving and stable relationship for children so that they could know they are safe, they could know they are loved and cared for. And this also makes it very clear, friends, that abortion should never be an option. God said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Not, it's your body, it's your choice, do as you please. He didn't say that. Abortion to our Creator is nothing more than murdering a child of His. So Jesus, in these words, He lets us know that from the beginning, it is his intention that marriage is to be between a man and a woman only because only a male and female can procreate and have children. Newsflash, there is no other way to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And the Word of God is so clear when it comes to the sin of homosexuality it teaches you shall not lie with a male as with a woman or a woman as with a male because it is an abomination to God. So thinking about that, why does this kind of thing happen in our world? How has this culture gotten so far off track? Well, it's simply the work of the devil, friends, and the sin that he brought into the world. You see, it is the goal of Satan to deceive and lead people astray from the love of God in Christ. So he takes the most noble and beautiful gifts of God and perverts them into something profane and ugly. But the good news is, <laughs> and it's such good news, that God so loved the world, everyone, that he sent Jesus as the Savior for all people. And God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ Jesus died for us. And all that is needed to experience that eternal love is true repentance of sins and the gift of God's forgiveness freely offered 
in Christ Jesus. In our second reading, Jesus says, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. These words teach us that salvation does not come out of some complicated intellectual practice. In other words, your eternity in heaven is not based on your own goodness or how many good things you may try to do to please a holy God. No. Jesus says the kingdom of God belongs to the child, which means if anyone wishes to possess God's wonderful kingdom, they must believe and they must trust just as a child believes and trusts. And think for a moment how astonishing this statement is. Christ says maturity and intellect have nothing to do with salvation. Instead, we are to become as children, possessing a childlike faith to enter the kingdom of God. Now, if these words of Jesus are true, which they certainly are, that means that children, even very young children, babies, must be able to receive and possess God's gift of faith. And think about what this means in regard to some well-meaning but wrong teachings about baptism and faith. I mean, just ask the average non-Lutheran evangelical Christian about infant baptism, and they are likely to insistently say that that is a man-made doctrine, man-made practice, and that the Bible nowhere teaches us to baptize our infants. You see, regrettably, they believe that in order for a child to receive the kingdom of God, the child must be like an adult. They must be a certain age in order to understand faith and then they can make a decision for Jesus and decide for themselves. Of course, that's a complete denial of the doctrine of original sin and this teaching from Jesus today. Because Jesus says the reverse is true. He tells us the child is the model to follow and not the adult. Jesus says it is the unassuming humility and unquestioning trustfulness of the child that's the pattern for all people to follow. And speaking of unquestioning trustfulness, have you ever seen a little infant with its mother? My newborn grandson displays this kind of unquestioning trustfulness with his mother Nina and his father Trevor. There is no doubt in my mind that that infant has complete trust in his parents to love him and he completely trusts in them both. This is the exact kind of childlike faith that Jesus is talking about. Consider these words from Lutheran theologian Oscar Pank regarding the faith of a child. He wrote, as the flower in the garden stretches toward the light of the sun, so there is in the child a mysterious inclination toward the eternal light. Have you ever noticed this mysterious thing? That when you tell the smallest child about God, it never asks with strangeness and wonder, what or who is God? I have never seen him but listens with shining face to the words as if they were soft, loving sounds from the land of home. Or when you teach a child to fold its little hands in prayer, that it does this as if it were a matter of course, as if there were opening for it that world of which it has been dreaming with longing and anticipation. Or tell them, these little ones, the stories of the Savior. Show them the pictures with scenes and personages of the Bible. And see how their pure eyes shine. How the little hearts beat with joy. Friends, children possess faith in God. And just because we can't fully understand it doesn't change the fact that they do. 
And Jesus tells us it is in this childlike humility and trustfulness when they are directed to him that become the very essence of a saving faith. And scripture itself testifies that a sinner is justified, made right before God through their unwavering trust in the atoning gift of grace God gave to us in Christ Jesus at our baptism. Which then means what is promised in baptism is given to all who receive it. Therefore, infants and young children also have the promise of God that baptism saves. Now as stated, many Christians wrongly believe that young children or infants can have faith. But let's again look at the Word of God and what He Himself says. Mark 10, 13, and 14 reads, And they were bringing children to Him that He might touch them. And the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, Let the children come to me. Do not hinder them. For to such belongs the kingdom of God. Now the first thing I want you to notice here is that people were bringing children to Jesus. They could not have been hindered from coming unless they were being brought so the children weren't coming on their own. They were taken by their parents or grandparents or relatives. So they were brought to Jesus because their parents, the grown-ups, took them to where Jesus was. These words the Holy Spirit moves St. Mark to record is a clear warning from God to every parent, every grandparent or guardian who neglects or refuses to bring their children to church where Jesus Christ is found. You see, the Lord knows if the children are kept from going into the church that he established on earth to hear the word rightly preached and the sacraments rightly administered, if the children are not hearing the truth of the Bible and learning about the Father's hatred of sin and his merciful plan of forgiveness offered in his son Jesus, they can never know him nor be saved. By him. And that is exactly the reason Jesus so forcefully reprimanded his disciples and was indignant, which means he was extremely irritated and displeased when they tried to stop the children from coming to him because he knows how damaging it can be to their eternal soul. Listen to these words the Holy Spirit led St. Luke to record of this incident that tells us that the children being brought to Jesus included infants. Luke 18 verse 15 reads, Now they were bringing even infants, barephos, even in the womb, infants to him that he might touch them. And when the disciples saw it, they rebuked them. The extreme irritation and anger from Christ toward his disciples for trying to prevent children from coming to him is one of the plainest indications we have in Scripture of just how much love Jesus has for the children. And the implication, of course, here is that children, and this includes babies, need to and are ready to come to where Jesus is from the earliest weeks of life. It's only up to the adults, the parents and the grandparents, to let them do so. And I'm so thankful to my son for bringing my less than a month old grandchild to church. God knows he's here and he's being filled with the gospel. Friends, Jesus teaches us today that he loves and cares for all children, which means he wants them properly taught and raised up in the church. He also says that the child is the example for the adult. So no matter one's age or stature, 
We need to possess the faith of a child because to such belongs the kingdom of God. Friends, salvation does not come through wisdom or intellect. It comes by faith, the faith of a child. And all throughout the Bible, the message is the same. Salvation is the simple childlike faith in the loving Savior and a personal confidence in the divine promises of the gospel that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So the question is, do you confess with your mouth to others, especially your children, that Jesus is Lord? Do you spend quality time teaching your children and grandchildren these truths? Or are you too busy being their best friend? Do you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead? Do you believe that Jesus conquered sin, death, and the power of the devil when he returned to life? Do you believe that Jesus has ascended back to his Father, where he now prepares a place for us, his children, children that are safe, loved, and cared for? Do you love God enough that you honor him in your marriage? If you're not married, do you love God enough to obey his will for your life and to be the man and woman that he, from the beginning, created you to be? Do you, friends, possess a childlike faith in Jesus? Our text concludes with St. Mark illustrating just how much love and concern Jesus has for all his children. Mark 10, 16 reads, And he took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands on them. I want you to think carefully about these words. Jesus took these children, including infants, into his own arms as his own dear children. Then he placed his hands upon them, symbolizing his delivery of his blessing. And then he says to the disciples and all those who were there, to such belongs the kingdom of God. Loved ones, Jesus commands that the children be brought to him. And that is exactly why you and I as Christians and as Christian parents and grandparents must be interested in the children. Why? Because you can tell a child all about Jesus and they will believe you. But if you don't tell your children about Jesus or you tell them other things, or you demonstrate by your own life that Christ doesn't mean too much, they will believe that too. Loved ones, a lifelong Christian marriage is so important to the Heavenly Father. Christian parents are so important to the Heavenly Father. And most of all, Christian parents who raise their children in the church to grow up to be church-going Christians are so important and so very pleasing to the Father and Christ the Son. So take to heart these words of Christ today. Plant them deep within you. Then teach them diligently to your children. Talk about them when you sit with them in your home, when you walk with them down the street, when you lay them down to sleep, and when you wake them in the morning. Because faith comes from hearing, and every parent's role is to rightly instruct their children throughout their lives in the Lord. So they, along with you, will go into the loving arms of Jesus in his magnificent heavenly kingdom. Glorious Heavenly Father, 
Thank you, Father, for your word today. Allow the Holy Spirit now to open our hearts and our minds to these truthful words of the Bible. If anyone's conscience has been pricked today, please let them know that you love them, you care for them, and they simply need to trust in Christ and what he did for us on the cross to receive full pardon of our sins and our sinful lives. Thank you for sending the Lord Christ into this world to save me, a sinner. In his name we pray. Amen. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, a world without end. Amen.